Uh, we're really honored to have um, Dr. Annalisa Cox here with us today. And uh, you've um, undoubtedly got one of her bio sheets, so I won't go through it all, but she, she is um, a, an active historian, writer, uh, lecturer. She's written a book about covert um, Michigan and uh, includes many of the families, the Connor family, the Pompeys are included there, and in covert, and also a connection with Henry Shepard, who was an uh, African American Underground Railroad conductor right here in Cass, who moved to covert after the Civil War. And we discovered Henry Shepard, this amazing story, through Dr. Cox's book, and has since discovered Martin, Martin Shepard, the man that we married, the 15 kids, and all were raised in Cass schools. We know where their homestead was, right there where the, the cemetery is in Vandalia. And this is part of our, we have a 14 site driving tour. And uh, so the story keeps growing and growing, and it doesn't grow, it unfolds. This is the story knocking at our door, waiting to be told. The story of what happened here around Vandalia, Cass County, uh, was almost lost. And we are, through the efforts of many, over many years, recovering it and telling it to the world. And the world is, is starting to pay attention. What happened here is very, very important. And, um, is now uh, being recognized for the importance that it has. And, the, and actually, the legacy of the Underground Railroad is still manifest all around us in Vandalia. And we heard baby Maurice Sanders talk yesterday. We heard, we saw the kids. We, you know, descendants of all these people connected are still here. And it's made Vandalia the unique community that it is and what we can be so proud of to, to be a part of and to all help in continuing the story. So, um, Dr. Cox is a fellow at Harvard. She works with uh, uh, Henry Gates, who you might be all familiar with, is very, very famous in the, in the uh, historic world and in the history of African Americans. And um, um, we are just uh, thrilled to have her. She's a consultant, that's what I want to say. She's a consultant for the new African American uh, Cultural Museum at, at the Smithsonian. And Cass County is going to be part of that. I'll, I'll let you. I'll let her tell you about it. But we're very honored to have Dr. Anne Lisa Cox. Thank you. Let's see if I can do this without the mic because I hate mics. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. If you cannot say something, um, I get louder as I get more excited, and I am excited about this. So. First of all, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm delighted to be given this opportunity. Um, I have my mistake pen with me. I bring this every time I give a talk in a community like this one. Because while I know a lot about the background history, the broader history, I know I don't know all the facts of the detailed history of these communities. So I hope, as I'm talking, you're like, that doesn't sound right. Write it down. Ask me a question after my talk. Find me after my talk. I've got my mistake pen. I will fix it. I will fix it. Um, as uh, as was mentioned, I am delighted to say that uh, I was just I just got an email a couple weeks ago from the curator I work with at the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, and that will be opening uh, in Washington D.C. on the Mall next year. Um, that. As part of this major permanent exhibit that he and I have been working on, on the movement of free African Americans to the antebellum Midwestern frontier, uh, he'll be looking at one particular community in southwestern Indiana that will be the starting off point. Then he's going to be looking at five other communities in the old Northwest Territory states. And those states are Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Ohio. And the community he's picked for Michigan is Cass County. Um, so I am just, I was so thrilled when he told me that. And in fact, he said, uh, I said, you know, I'm going to be there. Uh, is, this, is this exhibit set in stone? He said, no, I've got about one or two more months. If you find any pictures, if you talk to any people, tell me. So if folks have any photos or anything they want in the Smithsonian, please let me know. <laughs> I would be glad for anything I get my hands on at this point. Um, but... Uh, that, that, that said, I will, um, I will get into my talk. It will be about 40 minutes long. I want to have plenty of time for questions afterwards. Um, I do want to say that I'm in the middle of a research trip. I leave at 5 o'clock tomorrow morning on a flight to Wisconsin to look at another 
um, early African American settlement there. I just started working with the Spencer Foundation who gave me a major grant for a year of research. This is the project that um, Professor Henry Louis Gates Jr. has also signed up on um, to look at this movement of free African Americans uh, onto the antebellum frontier and also the ways that they were searching to educate their children. So this is something else that I'm really excited about at the moment. I'm going to start with a quote. This is a quote given in 1849 at the Ohio Black Convention. We inform our opposers that we are coming, coming for our rights, coming through the constitution of our common country, coming through the law. And relying upon God and the justice of our cause, we pledge ourselves never to cease our resistance to tyranny, whether it be in the iron manacles of the slave or in the unjust written manacles for the free. My first book, as many of you know, was on the rural community of Covert, Michigan. St and starting in the 1860s, the people of that place broke both laws and social expectations to develop a community of radical equality. Schools and churches were completely integrated, blacks and whites married, and power and wealth were shared between the races. Together, over the next 50 years, these residents of Covert, Michigan continued to shatter the legal and social barriers to black freedom. When I went on book tour, longer ago than I like to remember, people kept coming up to me afterwards and asking, have you heard of this community or have you heard of that community? And I hadn't. So I feel like a fool, I look it up, and then I realized nobody had. Nothing in the record books about that community. I started to dig, and I started to uncover many more communities founded by African American pioneers and farmers across the rural 19th century Midwest. So far, I have found almost 70 of them, but I know I have missed a lot. And my research on these African American pioneers and the communities they created will be the basis of my next book, as well as that exhibit at the Smithsonian. One of the first things I found when I started digging was in Stephen Vincent's excellent book, Southern Sea, Northern Soil. And that was that the antebellum movement of free African Americans on the old Northwest Territory states I'm going to repeat it, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin was truly our first great migration. And the movement was large. By 1860, over 63,000 African Americans were living in those old Northwest Territory states. But unlike the great migration of the 20th century, this one was an overwhelmingly rural to rural movement. So it wasn't rural to urban, it was rural to rural. This makes sense, because before the Industrial Revolution, the way to really get ahead in this nation was to own good land and to farm it. Through extraordinary and often illegal efforts, these pioneering African Americans were able to obtain wealth, access to education, freedom of worship, and political and social leadership. Now, there's long been the assumption that settlement on the Midwestern frontier was an almost impossible feat for antebellum African Americans, most of whom were assumed to be either those escaping bondage or recently freed people who came with almost no resources. Indeed, instead, this diasporic movement seemed to have been led largely by free people of African descent who came onto the frontier with resources and a sophisticated understanding of the complicated legal challenges to their settlement. By making a journey that held great risk to their freedom, these African American pioneers were intent upon obtaining more than just a living on the land. Their actions make it clear that they were intent upon gaining much that had been denied to them in the South, including the chance to become successful rural entrepreneurs, to worship freely, educate their children, and to fight against racism and slavery. These African American pioneers were able to win much of these rights within the numerous settlements they founded across the Old Northwest. Indeed, it was in the Midwest that the nation's first African American was elected into political office. It wasn't New York City, it wasn't Boston, it wasn't Philadelphia, it was the Midwest. Ohio. Uh, actually, Ohio. By both coming into and settling on the Midwestern frontier constituted a formidable challenge to free people of African descent. 
which makes this diaspora all the more surprising. Not the least of their challenges was economic. In order to create a 160-acre farm in Frontier, Illinois, for example, around 1830s, which would be large enough to allow its owner to become a successful commercial farmer, the cost at that time was close to $1,000. Now that may not seem like a lot now, but in the 1830s that was a small fortune. A lot of people at that time were making less than $100 a year. This amount takes into the account the price of federal land at $1.25 an acre, as well as the cost of building, housing, and barns. The very act of buying that land could put African Americans at risk of further costs. For those whites who were responsible for selling government land could decide to enforce black code bonds. Bonds that could add an additional $500 to $1,000 in all of the old Northwest territories and states except for Wisconsin. <coughs> While the nature of these black codes changed over the years, they all included barriers to settlement. Most usually the requirement of free papers and the payment of a, a substantial cash sum. They also included various regulations denying African Americans the right to vote and legal and educational rights afforded to whites. Yet despite the black codes and the high cost of settlement on the frontier, African Americans came by the thousands to make the old Northwest frontier their home. <coughs> Indeed, in some areas of North Carolina and Virginia, the number of people leaving during the height of this diaspora was notable. Between 1833 and 1835, 34 of the 50 tax-paying free families left Greenville County, North Carolina. People were writing about it in the newspaper. Because people were just leaving. During that same decade, there were clear patterns of out-migration by free African Americans in Virginia as well. The numbers and success of these African American pioneers raises the troubling question of whether these black codes may have been created in response to what was seen as the growing threat of African-American settlement on what was supposed to be a white frontier. What can be known is that the racist laws had a direct effect on these settlements. Indeed, the codes were a tool used by whites in the infamous Cincinnati race riot of 1829, in which whites rioted and drove out hundreds of African-Americans in the city, many of whom left for Canada. The codes also had an effect on settlement in rural areas, effects that are clearly visible on the settlement map. On the three border states in this study, Illinois had the harshest black codes in place during the period that saw the highest migration into the old Northwest Territory states. And a strongly pro-slavery white elite created indenture laws that all but legalized slavery in the early 19th century. Now indenture was a form of servitude, where somebody would sign over their life for a particular period of time to somebody else, at which point of time they were meant to have been taught a trade, be given a certain amount of money, uh, maybe a horse, maybe a suit of clothing. Uh, so these were called indenture bonds. However, on the frontier Midwest, these got corrupted a little bit because slavery was legally um, banned in the Old Northwest Territory states, but if, for example, in the city of Vincennes in the 1820s, there were, there were actually auctions of indentured servants going on in Vincennes, Indiana. So the, the lines were a little bit, a little bit blurry. In 18, oh, 
Indeed, the codes were a tool used by whites in the infamous Cincinnati race riot of 1829, in which whites rioted and drove out hundreds of African Americans in the city, many of whom left for Canada. The codes also had an effect on settlement in rural areas, effects that are clearly visible on the settlement map. On the three border states in this study, Illinois had the harshest black codes in place during the period that saw the highest migration into the old Northwest Territory states. And a strongly pro-slavery white elite created indenture laws that all but legalized slavery in the early 19th century. Now indenture was a form of servitude where somebody would sign over their life for a particular period of time to somebody else, at which point of time they were meant to have been taught a trade, be given a certain amount of money, uh, maybe a horse, maybe a suit of clothing. Uh, so these were called indenture bonds. However, on the frontier Midwest, these got corrupted a little bit because slavery was legally um, banned in the old Northwest Territory states. But if, for example, in the city of Vincennes in the 1820s, there were, there were actually auctions of indentured servants going on in Vincennes, Indiana. So the, the lines were a little bit, a little bit blurry. In 18, oh, by 1810, Illinois' population was 5% African American, 1810. In 1813, a code was created barring any new free African Americans from entering the state at all. Now, notice the word free. It didn't say anything about people in Barbie. Free. And requiring those that live there already to register with local officials. Failure to abide by the code could result in a whipping of the offender, and I'm quoting from the law here, on his or her bare back, not exceeding 39 stripes, nor less than 25 stripes. Six years later, the state passed a law forbidding assemblage by any people of African descent. This was one of the ways they tried to destroy the churches in Illinois. Admittedly, by 1829, Illinois decided to allow African Americans to enter the state as long as they recorded free papers and paid a bond. But that bond amount was raised to $1,000 in 1845, fully double that of any other black code bond required, required in the old Northwest Territory states. While 27% of African Americans in Illinois were enslaved in 1810, the black codes passed after that date obviously had a devastating effect on the free population of that state, which went from 5% of the population to around half a percent of the general population by 1850, which gave Illinois the lowest percentage as well as the lowest real numbers of any of the Midwestern border states. Of course, this did not keep all free African Americans from settling in Illinois, but those who did would have been forced to contend with the laws or hide from them. Certainly, one reason why so few African American settlements are apparent in Illinois could be because African American pioneers there had to be very careful about letting themselves be counted. For example, Walden Stewart, a wealthy, landholding, free African American from North Carolina, who arrived in Illinois in the late 1830s, never allowed himself or his family to be recorded in that state. Once he moved to Wisconsin in the late 1850s, however, the entire family allowed itself to be enumerated in the federal census. How do you know they were in Illinois? They said so, and on the census right there, every single one of his children was born in Illinois. <laughs> While some settlements may have been hidden, the vast difference in the number of rural settlements in Illinois and the other two border states in Indiana and Ohio would seem to reflect the very real impact. While the economic and legal challenges were daunting, the journey to the frontier held its own risks unique to free people of African descent, for in their very leaving, they were risking the little freedom they already had. And I think you folks have already been hearing some stories about the Connor travel north. Even though they were free, they were putting themselves at risk. The iconic traveler of African descent moving into and through the antebellum old northwest 
has long been seen as a person escaping bondage on the Underground Railroad. However, that journey also held the danger of bondage to those already free. For the risk of enslavement was very real for those free African Americans traveling to the old Northwest territories and states. Even though most of these free blacks seem to have traveled with free papers, which are legal documents attesting to their free state, once they left their home community in the South, they must have been seen as easy pickings by whites who viewed them as walking wealth. After all, by 1837, the market value of a healthy man of African descent was $1,300. A fact that these free African American pioneers were almost certainly aware of. Indeed, some of the descendants of these pioneers preserved stories of the dangers their ancestors faced when they traveled to the frontier. Stories that included both attempted and successful kidnappings. And some families ended up traveling secretly at night, just as their brethren in bondage did, boarded to escape capital. While such risks inherent on the journey, well, with such risks inherent on the journey, some of the early free black pioneers decided to travel with sympathetic white Quakers. The communities in Randolph County, Orange County, and Hamilton County, Indiana, as well as Cass County in Michigan, and Rocky Fork, Illinois, were all sites where Quakers and free African Americans settled near to each other on the frontier. Since they arrived on the frontier, however, many African Americans seemed intent on forming their own settlements. So who were these African Americans who chose to make the journey to a frontier where they were unwelcome and unwanted? A large percentage of these settlers seemed to be free blacks from North Carolina and Virginia. Both of these states saw a great number of manumissions, which is a fancy word for releasing people from bondage, just after the Revolutionary War. Manumissions that resulted in a strengthening of the laws in the Upper South against the freeing of slaves. So here's what happened. We had the Revolutionary War, and a whole lot of whites who owned people of African descent understood the irony of we are all created equal, right? So they started letting all those people go. They said, right, slavery doesn't work in this country. We're supposed to be a nation of free people. So they started freeing the people that were thought of as their property. The, the powers that be <laughs> in those slave states started freaking out and passing laws that made it harder and harder to release somebody in bondage even if you wanted to. By the early 19th century, this is early 19th century, Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina had the highest number of free African Americans in, of any of the southern slaveholding states, and thus a larger number that could join this diaspora. For those who were freed after the wars, the timing of these post-revolutionary war emancipations meant that by the 1820s and 30s, their families had been free for two or three generations and been, had been able to establish themselves to a degree that would allow for a more successful attempt on the frontier. Of course, other free, free black pioneering families were directly connected to the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. They were, they were either veterans themselves or had a family patriarch that had joined up and survived the conflict. At first, the relative lack of participation in this movement on the part of Maryland's free blacks seems puzzling, for its population was much larger than North Carolina's. The answer to why Maryland does not figure more heavily in this movement could lie in the areas of settlement and occupation of free African Americans in that state. Maryland's free population was primarily urban, while North Carolina was primarily rural which meant that a vast majority of its sizable free African-American population was involved in rural and agricultural pursuits. While many of Virginia's free blacks also lived in urban areas, there was also a population of landed, rural, free people of African descent living lives of surprising freedom and integration with their white neighbors in Virginia. 
One can only imagine how daunting the thought of leaving a settled home for the frontier must have been for these pioneers. But those who already owned or farmed the land and had learned to navigate that difficult life in a white-dominated society had a distinct advantage moving into the wilderness that was the antebellum frontier. Some of the families that made up this diaspora had been free before the revolution and seemed to have been members of what Ira Berlin termed the charter generation. These Atlantic Creoles came to the New World as early as the 17th century, the Connors being one of those families, and in smaller numbers than those who would have to survive the massive and horrific Middle Passage. When they came to the Americas, they often freely mingled with the native and white population already there, and by the mid-19th century, they made up the core of free land-owning blacks in the South. On the other side of the spectrum were those African-American pioneers who had not been freed by anyone, but had worked to buy their own freedom. Indeed, David Gerber noted that as many as 20% of African-Americans in two Southern Ohio African-American communities had bought their own freedom, or had been brought into freedom, had been bought into freedom by kin or loved ones. At least three settlements listed in this study are known to be founded for what, by what I call freedom entrepreneurs. New Philadelphia, Illinois was founded by Free Franklin Border. Brooklyn, Illinois was founded by Priscilla Baltimore. And Cornelius Neal Elliott was the founder of Grayson, Illinois. McWhorter's mother had been born in Africa and had given birth to her son in bondage in Kentucky. There, he labored for years in the saltpeter mines, and he gained his freedom. He used the War of 1812 to his advantage, because saltpeter was necessary to create a creation of gunpowder. Um, and so all of a sudden, the value of saltpeter went sky high. So he was working in these devastating conditions in these mines in Kentucky, but he was able to work a little extra, make a little extra money on the side, and buy his own freedom. And I've often thought, the personal dynamics of this have to be so difficult because you're talking to a white person who believes they own you and you say, look, I'd like to buy my freedom. And that person thinks, right, okay, this person is probably worth $500 on the slave market, but I'm going to say that you're worth $1,000. you are going to have to come up with $1,000. And this became such a problem that sometimes African Americans who were trying to buy their own freedom would go, would try to find a sympathetic white and do it underhand say, look, I can't go to my owner and say, I need to buy my freedom. He'll raise the price through the roof. So I need you to go to him. But then, of course, there's a lot of trust involved because the, uh, that African American is handing over, what, $800 or $1,000 to a white person to give to another white? I mean, it's, there, there are some successes, but there was a lot of disappointments too. Once free, he moved to Illinois, where he became the first African American in Illinois to legally plat a town in about 1836, the community of New Philadelphia. Like Enoch Harris, McWhorter was brilliant at real estate transactions, and with every plot of land he sold in New Philadelphia, often to whites, he bought another member of his family, bringing them to live with him in Illinois. I call this a different kind of property flipping, right? <laughs> <laughs> Cornelius Elliott, also in Illinois, lived in the salt mines of Saline, Illinois. And you know, when I saw that movie Django Unchained, and they're talking about sending him to the mines, this is the first thing I thought of. Because the salt mines in Illinois were just, I mean, this is like 1820s. They were not a good place to be. He worked those mines in Saline, Illinois, to purchase not only his own freedom, but also the freedom of eight team of his family members, as well as the indenture bond of his white wife. She was white, but she was held in indentured servitude. He then purchased land outside of Saline in the 1840s, where he founded the community of Grayson, becoming the owner of 200 acres and the inn there. Priscilla Baltimore was both a community founder and a spiritual leader, who bought her own freedom for $1,100 before going on to found the community of Brooklyn, Illinois, in the 1830s. Recently freed people of African descent also had another reason to leave the South. 
They had to. In an attempt to discourage manumissions, by the 1820s, all the states of the Upper South had passed legislation requiring that anybody free had to leave the state within 12 months' time who risk being legally re-enslaved. Now, this may not sound too bad, but think about it. Um, you're a 50-year-old woman, and somebody decides in the family that owns you that they're going to free you. However, your husband, your children, and your grandchildren are all living there. And you have to leave. So the courts are full of petitions at this time, saying, I really don't want to leave. My family's here. For those who had been free, and property owners in the South, however, the decision to leave must have been much harder. Many of the free blacks who left North Carolina and Virginia seemed to have had advantages in their home state that would preclude their leaving. And overall, those who left were a minority, many stayed. In the South, they often lived among large kin groups whose support they could rely on. They were free. Many were property owners. And in some cases, some unusual cases, that property included slaves. Additionally, land-owning free blacks in North Carolina had the right to vote until 1835, which meant that those who left before then actually had to leave behind that civil right because no Midwestern state would allow an African American to vote. Strange or true? There were growing pressures, however, to leave their home states in the slave south. A direct influence on this diaspora seems to have been the deliberate destruction of social and legal rights for free blacks. In a truly punitive measure, North Carolina's Free Black Code of 1830 stated that any free person of African descent who left the state for more than 90 days would forfeit their freedom if they ever returned to North Carolina. Which meant he had family out of state, say in Baltimore, took a while to get there, you came back, there went your freedom. This meant that those decided to leave for, say, Cass County, Michigan, had to face the fact for me to say this, that they may not ever be able to return. The legal reaction to the Nat Turner Slave Rebellion of 1831 only made a bad situation worse, with the right to worship together, as well as to get an education taken away from all people of African descent in North Carolina and Virginia. In Tennessee, they took away their right to bear arms. By the 1850s, hostility towards free blacks had become so pronounced that most southern states had considered legislation that would force free blacks within their states into slavery. It is no surprise, then, that a central goal for the free African Americans of North Carolina and Virginia who made the risky trek to the frontier was not just to own land, but also to regain the rights that had been taken from them. Of course, not all free people of color came with sufficient funds to buy land and start farming right away. In Indiana's Randolph and Wayne counties, some free African Americans worked for the Quakers they had come with in a form of indentured servitude, with the promise of schooling and payment in the form of livestock and tools at the end of their allotted time. Yet many African Americans who came to the Old Northwest obviously did have the resources to buy land and create communities, given the number of settlements they created and the amount of land they owned. Indeed, settlements where African Americans owned thousands of acres was not rare. In Lick Creek, Indiana, African American land ownership went from 780 acres in 1840 to 1,440 acres in 1850, just to 10 years. At least five rural antebellum communities in western Ohio were the site of huge African American land holdings, with African Americans in Mercer County owning over 10,000 acres by 1859. While not a few had residents that owned land worth $1,000 or more, some attained land that went far beyond that amount. Indeed, Collier Simpson and Thornton Alexander of Randolph County, Indiana, where I was just there, I just was there yesterday, both had land holdings that were worth around $4,000 each in 1850. And let me tell you something. I just saw one of their homes. And it was, it, 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 it looked like um, a plantation home in the south. It was this huge brick house, two chimneys, 
beautiful big barn. Um, and this is, this is before the Civil War. Most of the wealthy came onto the frontier as older settlers, often married with children, and with the resources to replicate or exceed their economic positions in the South. Arthur Allen was one such pioneer. He decided to move his family from their home in Northampton County, North Carolina, to Illinois in the late 1820s, when he and his wife were both in their 40s and had eight children. Can you imagine the conversation between that couple? Or they decided to do that. They were free and came with enough money to pay cash for a settled farm of 80 acres that a white family was selling. By the time of his death in 1840, Arthur Allen owned 320 acres and had loaned over $700 to local farmers, many of them white. In addition, four of his sons and a son-in-law owned over 1,000 acres of farmland, which made the Allen family agricultural elites in the county. Another example is a group of wealthy free African American families who left the area near Richmond, Virginia around 1830 to come to Ohio. While they seem to have traveled together, once they arrived, they scattered across the Ohio countryside. Abraham and Mary Good Depp chose Concord Township in Delaware County, where they bought around 600 acres that was worth $7,500 in 1850. And you know, I'm a historian, I sometimes forget I need to convert these numbers, because $7,500 doesn't sound like a whole lot of money, but this is, this is years worth of salary for a normal, working, laboring American, who at that time, in 1850, was probably going to be making about $100 a year. So this is, these are the equivalent of millionaires. Their fellow pioneers, Pleasant and Catherine Litchford, bought a similar amount of land, so around 600 acres, in the township of Perry in Franklin County, Ohio. Pleasant was born around 1789, so like Arthur Allen and many of his fellow travelers, he was approaching middle age by the time he and his family arrived in the Old Northwest. So this wasn't just a young man's game. In 1850, his land alone was worth $8,000, making him one of the four wealthiest landowners, black or white, in the township. Of course, the importance of these farm elites went like beyond mere symbolism. For their wealth allowed them to become foundational in their communities, aiding those communities in achieving what had been denied them in the South, the ability to worship freely and to educate their children. Some, like, and I, I want to be clear, I say educate their children. After the Nat Turner Rebellion, it became illegal for anyone, black or white, to teach a child of African descent to read. Period. You were not allowed to read. It was against them. Some, like the Reverend W. Chandler, combined both his vocation as a minister as well as the managing of a large and successful farm. The Reverend Chandler had been born in North Carolina in 1810, and by 1850, his farm in Lost Creek, Indiana, was worth $3,000. Lost Creek Township was also the residence of a small group of Quakers. While these free people of African descent and local Quakers worked together to shelter people escaping bondage along the Underground Railroad, the Reverend Chandler is indicative of some African Americans' desire to create a community apart from Quakers, because he was the AME pastor. So they, the African Americans in that community wanted their own church. One of the reasons that not a few of these African American pioneers created communities separate from Quaker settlements may have been the desire to have their own place of worship. Having been denied the right to worship formally under an African American minister of their own choosing in the South, and that was part of that whole Nat Turner slave rebellion thing. It's not that you were not allowed to congregate, that was one of the laws, but then you were not allowed to have a black pastor leading your worship. That was illegal. Mm -hmm. Many of these settlements are quick to found churches within the African Methodist or Baptist denominations. The Reverend William Paul Quinn was a central figure in the creation of a number of AME churches across the Midwestern frontier. His background is a little dim. But the Reverend Quinn was licensed to preach in Pennsylvania in 1812, and in 1833 he was assigned as an itinerant preacher to the Ohio Conference, a region that included all of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. And I just keep on thinking, okay, this guy's getting on the back of a horse, and he's riding into the wilderness to try to find communities and found churches. I, I just can't even. <laughs> It's hard enough. I just finished driving in that area today, and it's hard enough. 
As a circuit rider active in those states, the Reverend Quinn preached in various free black frontier settlements and helped to found numerous churches in these communities. So many churches were created through his efforts. He claimed 47 by 1844, and the efforts of African American community founders in Indiana, that Indiana became the sixth AME conference in 1840. With the bulk of the organization's churches and rural and frontier communities in Indiana, it is not surprising that the Indiana conference was officially organized at the rural beach settlement in Rush County, not Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. The twin goals of freedom of worship and education were often tied together intimately in these communities. While laws regarding the formation of a state-sponsored public school system often came after some of these African Americans arrived in the Old Northwest, through the 1840s, all of the Old Northwest Territory states had black codes that forbade integrated public schools. And most of the states carried such laws on their books for decades after. Despite such laws, some African American children still attended public schools with their white counterparts, but such cases were rare. This meant that most African Americans in the rural Midwest had to find their own way to educate their children. In many communities, this meant that churches often doubled as schools. In 1837, the Quaker Augustus Wattles, what a name, <laughs> sent a report to the Ohio based abolitionist paper, The Philanthropist, entitled Colored schools in Ohio. While a number of the schools were in communities that were set up by whites as homes for manumitted slaves, or were in urban areas of over 4,000, not a few mentioned are in rural and frontier African American settlements. Indeed, Waddles reported that the school in Dark County was taught by an African American woman. He noted, however, that a number of rural settlements were in need of teachers, including the Beach Settlement in Rush County, Indiana, which by 1837 had 75 scholars. In some cases, wealthy African American farmers had to come up with creative solutions when no schools were available for their children. This is one of my favorite stories. In Illinois, Arthur Allen, that wealthy Arthur Allen, hired a local white teacher who also happens to be the local justice of the peace to privately <laughs> tutor his children. One of the most astonishing examples of educational activism on the part of these pioneers, however, was the Union Literary Institute, founded in 1845 in rural Randolph County, Indiana. I just came from studying it and walking around the building. The Union Literary Institute was a boarding school that was also a labor school that was open to both boys and girls, and was specifically created to be an integrated school. Okay, so the original chart, this is 1845. Think of 1845. What's going on? Um, mainly frontier, kind of the middle of nowhere. There's lots of revolutionary activity happening in Europe. The labor school movement's just getting started. And a group of African Americans and whites sit down at a table, probably in a log cabin, in a little area of rural Indiana, Ohio, right on the border there. And they say, all right, we're going to found a school. We're going to let anybody attend, regardless of gender, status. They can use the word class in those days. Status, creed, that means religion, or color, which is pretty radical. Indeed, oh. Unlike the other ra rural radical institutions over them, which was also founded with a specific mission to educate African Americans, the Union Literary Institute was founded by both whites and African Americans in a county that was already home to African American settlements. Indeed, many African Americans donated money to start the school, with the wealthy Thornton Alexander donating land and monies and sitting on the board. The school's first president, William Clemens, was African American, and by 1850, 131 students were enrolled in the school, 97 of them, it would be 73%, were of African descent. And they were, they were collecting hundreds of dollars in money from Nantucket, Philadelphia, Boston, New York City, to fund the school, which is still in the middle of nowhere, in Ohio, in Indiana. Right on that, it's Indiana, but Indiana, Ohio border. I just, I think about how do you, get from there. 
the island of Nantucket and talk to whalers and convince them to give you $200 for this school. Incredible people. While most African Americans in the antebellum Midwest had to turn to their own resources to educate their children, despite the fact that they were often having to pay local school taxes, there's evidence that some public schools allowed African American children to attend despite state laws. Many schools in Cass County, Michigan were integrated despite state laws. For years, African American parents petitioned the state to be allowed to vote in school district meetings as well as to run for and hold office in the local school district councils. In 1855, they finally won their struggle, although the state legislature did not extend the right to any African Americans outside the county. Indeed, <clears throat> suffrage rights seem to have been as rare, if not rarer, in the antebellum old Northwest than educational rights. African Americans, however, constantly struggled to gain their citizenship rights, despite white voters' consistent denial of such rights. As in Cass County, there were a few local exceptions, such as in the area around Oberlin College, as well as in Greene County, Ohio. Suffrage rights and the right to hold political office were of great importance to free African Americans across the nation. And the Midwest's African Americans were not alone in their struggle for those rights. They were alone, however, in their winning of them. In 1855, John Mercer Langston became the first African American elected to public office in the United States. This is Langston Hughes' great much like Free Frank and Porter, Langston was able to thrive as a lone African American farmer surrounded by woods and whites. Langston's father was a wealthy landowner of Virginia who once owned Langston's mother, but had freed her and her children. Upon his death, he bequeathed large sums to all of their children, including Langston. By the 1830s, the eldest of these children and the young John Mercer Langston moved to Ohio. Part of his youth was spent in Cincinnati, where he witnessed the race riot of 1841, a riot where white mobs attempted to attack and drive out the African Americans. And of course, it's a I suggest While it cannot be known how influential that riot or life in that city was to Langston, what is known is that once he came into his inheritance at the age of 21, he chose to invest it in the education of Oberlin and in primarily rural ventures, namely large farms in Ohio, one of which became his home in the all-white township of Browntown. Now, this is a little side about John Langston. I think he's such an amazing character. He also became the first African-American in the state of Ohio to become a lawyer to pass the bar. So he was sort of a gentleman farmer. He owned this huge farm in Browntown, uh, but he didn't actually farm it. They hired a middle-aged English couple to farm the farm for him. And they was concerned about their cabbage. He thought he was absolutely like this. <laughs> By the time of Langston's election in March of 1855, he was an Oberlin graduate and Ohio's first African-American lawyer. He and his wife were living on his farm in Brownton town Township, Ohio, when he was encouraged to run for the position of clerk in that township. He later wrote a wry account of the event to his friend, Frederick Douglass, stating, here's what he wrote. <clears throat> they put up a coward man, and he was elected clerk of Brown Town by a handsome majority indeed. Since I'm the only colored man who lives in this township, you can easily guess the name of the man who was so fortunate as to secure this election. <laughs> <laughs> Admittedly, formal political positions were denied to most African in the rural and frontier Midwest during this time, but they still found ways to have political influence, particularly through the Black Convention Movement. The convention started in New York and Philadelphia around 1830, primarily in response to the Cincinnati race riot of 1829. So these are conventions starting on the East Coast, affected by things that are happening in the Midwest. Everything's connected, as well as to the increased efforts movement to remove free African Americans from American soil. 
when you do have a question about colonization, you can ask them. By 1837, conventions had started in Ohio, and from there the movement spread to Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan. While the Midwestern conventions were not immune from the infighting politics that plagued the conventions in New York and Philadelphia, they proved to be potent assemblies that directly influenced legislation in their home states, such as the attack and eventual destruction of many of Ohio's racist black code laws in 1849. One could argue that by becoming successful farmers, these African American pioneers were living out an ideal presented by leaders of the convention movement. In 1843, the leaders of the Michigan Convention reminded those assembled that, and I quote, agriculture is the bone and sinew of our country. Therefore, be it resolved that we recommend it to our people as best calculated to promote their rise and progress. While most convention leaders across the nation Sorted African Americans towards this goal, and some of the Eastern Convention leaders, Paul Urban, even tried to start rural agricultural communities. It was the landed and elevated farmers of the Midwest who were supporting the conventions in the Midwest. Nine of the named participants of the conventions held in Iowa and Indiana between 1849 and 1857 were farmers whose land holdings were worth a thousand dollars or more. As leaders of a Midwestern African-American rural community exhorted their brethren in Cleveland in 1843, this happened, and this was, uh, they sent this as a letter that was printed uh, in the local newspaper in Cleveland. Those of you who live in towns and follow those precarious occupations for a livelihood, which prejudice has assigned to you, would you not be serving your country and your race to more purpose? If you were to leave your present residences and employment and go into the country and become a part of the bone and sinew of the land, our employment must be of that character that people can see how we obtain our livelihood and that we are useful. What is it to the state when a waiter, a boot black, or a cook dies? It's not worse. While calls to move from the cities to rural areas were common in all of the conventions, in the Midwestern conventions, these calls took on an added weight, for they could well be made by those who become successful community founders and landowning elites in rural areas. Indeed, 16 of the rural settlements in my study were home, leader, home to leaders of these conventions. While most of the attendees are not mentioned by name, fortunately, the leaders of the conventions were, and two of them, Dr. Greenberry Cousins and a T.J. Martin came from Cats County. While these conventions were important, the very fact that their African American participants had come to the Midwest to settle was in, in itself, so they're very coming here to settle, a reputation and a challenge to the goals of the colonist movement. Of course, not all Midwestern African Americans were opposed to the concepts of the colonists who were determined to try to send any free African Americans back to Africa. But those who decided to stay in the Midwest were a physical manifestation of the rhetoric used by early opponents of the colonization movement. The participants of the 1849 Ohio Convention were clearly reminded of the fact that their very presence on the American frontier was unwanted, even by the most ardent of abolitionist colonist leaders. As the leaders of the convention noted to those gathered, Quote, we have put into our hands copies of a memorial to the General Assembly signed by David Christie, agent of the American Colonization Society, speaking of the increase of the colored people in the West. We're West. I want you to know where we're standing right now is considered West. Before the Civil War, this was the frontier. You know, it feels like the Midwest now, there it is the West. And especially in the state of Ohio. He urges their increase as a reason why the legislature of Ohio should furnish money to transport colored people from this state to, and here the leader pulls out the pamphlet with a flourish and reads from it, Ohio in Africa. Hmm. Hmm. They weren't interested. The leaders responded to David's Christie's missive by stating, 
that they refused to consider a move from Ohio and continue to fight even harder for equality there. Many of the African Americans who came to the old Northwest Territory frontier states must have been well aware of the hypocrisy in a stance that encouraged African Americans to return to Africa as civilizing colonizers, yet viewed them as unworthy settlers of the American frontier. And they could not escape the fact that their very movement under the frontier was unwelcome by many whites, especially as their farms and communities became larger and more successful. The 1850s made this terribly clear. The passing of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, followed by the infamous Supreme Court decision on the Dred Scott versus Sandiford case in 1857, were truly devastating events for these settlers. And not a few of these communities in the study seemed to, seemed to have disbanded by the end of the 1850s. The fact that some African Americans decided to leave their rural homes in the Midwest is not all that surprising, considering the fact that the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act was a particular threat to those in small rural settlements who could be easy targets for well-armed slave raiders, raiders now emboldened by the new law. The act was compounded by the passing of even harsher black code laws in Illinois and Indiana in 1851 and 1853, which banned entirely any African Americans from entering those states and severely curtailed their legal rights. So this means it's 1851, you've arrived on the uh, frontier in the 1830s, you're just got your barn, your house, your farm all underway, you're starting to send letters back to your family in Virginia saying, look, we're really getting settled, we have another church now, and all of a sudden, nobody can come in. Unwilling to risk a law that favored their capture and enslavement, and realizing that the growth of their communities through emigration from the South was now severely curtailed, a number of rural settlers who had been living in the border states of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois left their homesteads from Michigan and Wisconsin. And it's so interesting, because I was just down in central Indiana and central Ohio, talking to descendants of rural African-American settlements there. And they said, we don't know. We're looking at these plat maps and these census records. There's all these communities around here. They just disappeared after 1850. What happened? What? Why? Where did they go? And they would say, Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> and they left their homesteads for Michigan and Wisconsin. Others finally gave up on the idea of making America their home and left for Canada Haiti, or Africa. The flight from the border states is evident in the population of Cass County, Michigan, which grew exponentially during the 1850s, as did the percentage of African Americans in the entire state of Michigan. While Cass County was already an established home to African Americans, other Midwestern farming families like the Stewarts and the Bartons made the decision to head to the next American frontier in Wisconsin, where they became community founders. Conversely, the percentages of African Americans in Illinois and Indiana fell. Perhaps not surprisingly, as they both supported the act more that those states supported the act more enthusiastically than Ohio, Michigan, or Wisconsin did. And I was talking to the director of the African American Archives at the Indiana Historical Society, and she said, I just look at those numbers of people in Indiana between 1850 and 1860. And she said, up until 1850, the numbers of African Americans in Indiana just aren't up. And she said, in 1850, it, goes, it does this. She said, it's stagnant, mm -hmm. just stagnant. Yet even with the sorrow and uncertainty inherent in such a leaving, the free people of color who left their homes in the Midwest made it clear through their actions that they still saw themselves as a people with some control over their fate. One such example is the Morgan family, who sold their 200 acre, acres in Robeson County, North, yeah, Robeson County, North Carolina, to come to Indiana in the late 1840s. By the early 1850s, they decided to move once more, this time to Canada. And in the subsequent decade, they moved to Haiti, Maryland, and then back to the Midwest, where their grown children founded the community of Boyne City, Michigan, right after the Civil War. Of course, the concept of the Midwestern frontier as a place of unlimited freedom and equality has long been proven a fallacy, not least because people were held in bondage there well into the 1840s, despite the 1787 Northwest Ordinance banning slavery. Yet these settlements across the Midwest 
and those pioneers who fought to live successful lives there not only have the potential to profoundly change our concept of African Americans on the frontier during this most pivotal of pioneering periods, but all help us to better understand the intense debates of the time over the role that free people of African in the nation. By choosing on this contested borderland, the African Americans that made up this diaspora created pockets of freedom, places of resistance, and sites of struggle. These pioneers were not coming onto a white frontier. They were creating a black frontier. A frontier that allowed them to live, however briefly, and done tied to them the nation. something that probably is, is unique among these communities from what you're saying that they there is I certainly Cass County was certainly very early because they were doing it before the Civil War right. and that's why African Americans were able to successfully and it's really interesting because there's so many dynamics going on here because it was illegal for there to be integrated education but they were they somehow managed to get under the radar of that one so they had integrated public schools with funded by tax dollars, paid by African-American landowners in the area. And then African-American parents wanted to be able to vote and to sit on the school boards because they really cared about this. So that, that was happening early. Um, there are a few other examples, um, and I need to find out, one of the reasons I'm going out to Wisconsin is Cheyenne Valley was high, they, they were founded around 1853, so later in Cass County, but they also had a lot of integrated school 